A very warm welcome to this talk. How many times in your clinical practice you have come across conditions in which you have been seeing a child who comes to you with uh, let's say fever and some uh, symptoms like cough or maybe runny nose or just like high grade fever of a short duration and as a part of some like you know basic investigation your nurse does a urine dip and she brings that urine dip result to you and says doctor uh, it's showing uh, protein 1 or 2 plus and there's a bit of trace of leukocytes something so should I send this uh, specimen for culture sensitivity and you're scratching your head like uh, should we send or should we not just proteinuria mm -hmm. so you're just scratching your head sometimes you're not sure what to do with uh, this type of scenario sometimes what happens is that somebody sends you a patient and says like you know he has you know visited them for some let's say symptoms and they did a urine dip and it's showing protein one or plus so how do we assess proteinuria or in other words in this series of lectures we will be basically talking about how do we interpret some basic renal functions so in part one of this lecture we would be taking a deep dive into this world of renal function tests and we would focus on proteinuria so let's get started now what is proteinuria basically so proteinuria basically means proteins in urine so presence of protein in urine if it is detected by that chemical test which we call as urine dip that is known as proteinuria now they say that around 5 to 10 percent of school going children they would like if you take their samples that would show some form of proteinuria and that is defined if the protein is more than or equal to one or more than that but they say at the same time only 0.1 percent of these children have got persistent protein persistent protein means like you know if you check their urine specimen again and again and again you would find that there's a consistent pattern that they are showing protein uh, in their urine but for uh, you know uh, like a majority of the children would be having what we call as transient proteinuria that means like you know for some reason you did a urine dip and it was showing presence of protein at that point in time but there will be no persistent proteinuria so 5 to 10 percent of school going children would be showing some form of proteinuria that means that they, if you do their urine dip they would be showing the presence of protein in their urine now at the same time please also appreciate the fact that proteinuria as a marker of uh, renal disease is well established it means it's again research has shown that proteinuria basically can be used to assess uh, the grade of uh, renal function or in other words if the renal function is affected or if there is some form of renal disease uh, how fast it is progressing or in which stage it is so proteinuria can be used to determine those facts the actual dilemma is for a, like a primary pediatrician is to differentiate a child who has got transient proteinuria from that child who is what we call as persistent protein persistent proteinuria means that there is some form of underlying renal pathology which is causing like a sort of a constant presence of protein in their urine now normally normally i mean very few proteins are excreted in the urine in other words like it's very hard to detect proteins in a normal person urine why because number one proteins are large molecules so it's not easy for the kidney to filter them across a glomerular basement membrane or the glomerular you know capillary wall it's not easy for these big substances to pass through that even if they pass some of the proteins like you know the smaller ones they might pass through these gaps in the glomerulus but what happens is that they are reabsorbed back in the proximal tubule so the nephron you know is a like a sort of crescent shaped structure so one if the proteins they filter and it goes into proximal tubule some of it would be reabsorbed and they say like the smaller molecular uh, weight proteins they are easily reabsorbed by the proximal tubule now the normal protein excretion i mean obviously i told you that some of the smaller proteins would be filtered but they are reabsorbed so the normal uh, urinary ec protein excretion is less than 100 milligram per meter square so this meter square is like you know sort of a body surface area so per day so per day it should be less than 100 milligram in other words like you know less than 100 milligram is excreted in the urine per meter square 
or if you divide it like you know by hours so then it would come out to be around approximately like four milligram per meter square per hour now if there is like heavy presence of protein in the urine which we call as nephrotic range proteinuria or that means like the big molecules are being filtered and they are actually coming up in the urine that is when we say that the uh, you know the excretion of proteins is more than 1000 milligram per meter square per day where a day has got 24 hours so it would come out roughly to be around 40 milligram per meter square per hour so that is what we call as a nephrotic range protein that means like you know the damage to the glomerular basement membrane is as of such a degree that like that the larger molecules like albumin or something is just like freely filtering and then like, you know coming in the rear end so remember the normal is like 100 milligram per meter square in a day and if it is like around 1000 or more then we call it like nephrotic range proteinuria okay guys so moving on how do we classify proteinuria so most of the time the proteinuria is of glomerular uh, origin it simply means the glomerular basement membrane is damaged and the proteins are getting filtered into the urine and this is usually happens you know when the kidneys damage because of malaria's reason it could be acute kidney injury due to infections it could be because of immune processes it could be because of so many reasons like you know but what happens usually when the glomerular basement membrane is damaged the large proteins which is you know as like albumin is known as a macromolecule they freely can cross a glomerular capillary membrane and then you know they would be like you know filtering into the urine sometimes it can also occur in presence of certain physiological conditions like if there is fever and with the hypodynamic circulation that can lead to transient proteinuria like you know because there is like heavy flow and because of some turbulent flow into the kidneys and things some of the big molecules would be filtered into the urine if somebody is doing like intensive exercise heavy gym exercise or something that can also lead to like pushing of these like larger molecules into the urine and sometimes it can also happen like strangely with uh, what we call as posture so orthostatic or postural proteinuria prolonged standing they say for some reason can cause these molecules to filter we don't know whether the gravity is here like to be blamed or whatever the reasons are but for some reasons so some people or children in other words to be specific because of uh, prolonged standing like in the school or in the PE might lead to presence of proteins in their urine that's how, again we call it a transit protein urea but because it is uh, happening with posture and it never happens when they are in recumbent position or lying position we call it as orthostatic protein urea the other form of uh, what you call protein urea is like where the proteins are coming from the tubules glomerular mass like you know the basement membrane the glomerular membrane would be fine but there's something wrong with the tubular structures like tubulopathies different types of like renal tubular acidosis things like that what it does is that you know some low molecular weight proteins such as beta 2 microglobulin or alpha 1 microglobulin or retinol binding protein they would be filtered so they're not coming from the glomerular they're just like being filtered from the tubules because the tubule cells have got gaps between them or they're damaged or they're not properly able to perform their function like in different form of uh, interstitial nephritis or tubular interstitial nephritis these proteins would filter into the urine but they are coming from the tubules and not from the glomeruli and there is another term which is known as overflow uh, proteinuria rare thing but what happens sometimes if there is an overproduction of low molecular weight proteins what happens is that increased production and increased excretion what happened is that you know because the low molecular weight protein they are being filtered from the glomeruli and most you know in the normal physiology they would be reabsorbed back by the proximal tubule but like the flow is so heavy that the capacity of the tubules to reabsorb them back is overwhelmed so some of it would simply go into the urine get filtered and would be detected in the urine now this is a rare condition so usually not observed in uh, the pediatric uh, age uh, population it usually happens in adults and you know in certain conditions in which there is a you know sort of an overproduction of uh, abnormal proteins like for example the para proteins being uh, formed in uh, multiple myeloma and that's probably uh, mostly a problem of the adults but also keep it in mind that these types of protein what you call the overflow proteinuria 
like uh, which what can happen in multiple myeloma or something these are not detected by your urine dip uh, dip uh, dipstick test so they have to be uh, you know detected by specialized tests so in a nutshell proteinuria is classified as of glomerular origin of tubular origin or overflow proteinuria which is a rare thing and usually not observed in children uh, then a further classification of proteinuria apart from like being of glomerular or tubular origin is like the function classification so one is known as transit or intermittent proteinuria so transit or again the name shows transient for some time orthostatic which i would like explain in a moment is basically related to the posture and number three is persistent which you can also call as pathological i mean uh, because there is some good reason organic reason for the proteins to be constantly present in the urine so again before i dive into the transit or orthostatic remember orthostatic and transient both are benign conditions they do not require further evaluation if somebody has got transient like you know one of like because of fever because of exercise there is presence of protein in the urine and then it goes away the future samples are clear that is like transient or intermittent proteinuria because of fever or because of exercise or if somebody has got orthostatic proteinuria their protein is present in the urine because they were standing for a prolonged period of time but it's never present in the first morning you know urine sample then we call it as an orthostatic uh, proteinuria and uh, remember these are benign conditions they never ever require further evaluation now coming down to the um, persistent proteinuria persistent proteinuria means that you know uh, people or children would be having presence of proteins in their urine on every sample so usually if you go according because urine depth does not give you a sort of a quantitative estimation it usually gives you a sort of a qualitative presence of the protein so it will give you in a form of like let's say traces of one plus two plus three plus so any child who has got a urine uh, dip protein of one plus or greater in more than two samples so if you take two samples like which are spaced apart and they both show the presence of protein one or more than that then we call it as persistent proteinuria and again i told you that if this proteinuria it could be coming either from the glomeruli because of some let's say renal pathology or it could be coming from the tubules because of some tubular pathology but again here just to uh, summarize the thing remember transient proteinuria is transient it's like temporary condition occur can occur in fever so if a child comes with fever and he's got a, a protein of one plus or two plus and then that goes away when the fever settles down that is what we call as transit proteinuria or a child who hasn't got any like set, set of symptoms but like for some reason somebody does a urine dip and it he has been standing for a prolonged period of time and it shows let's say one or two plus of proteins in the urine dip but well i mean after that if he if, if you make him lie down for a couple of hours and you take a urine sample and it doesn't show any protein we call it orthostatic uh, proteinuria so orthostatic proteinuria is basically you know protein presence of proteinuria because of uh, prolonged standing position but persistent proteinuria means that you have got protein in more than two samples again this is also very important that um, these samples uh, should not be taken when the child has got uh, fever or something uh, basically because let's say if the child has had two episodes of fever where both were showing transient proteinuria uh, then obviously you might think it's persistent proteinuria so i will I, i'll explain that in a moment okay that how do we like for example uh, work up or how do we differentiate persistent from you know sort of a transient and orthostatic uh, proteinuria uh, not only on the base position but even if you are doing it on different occasions how would we know that uh, so uh, some of the diseases that can cause uh, persistent proteinuria uh, are like you know some form of glomerular diseases or it could be a tubular disease so some of the glomerular diseases could be like the nephrotic minimal change nephrotic syndrome which is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children uh, it could be congenital it could be acquired then there are different types of immune glomerular nephritis like for example focal segmental one form or the iga nephropathy burgers disease it could be membranoproliferative form of glomerular nephritis membranous nephropathy alport syndrome post-streptococcal like you know 
different forms of glomerulopathologies can give rise to persistent proteinuria uh, which can be detected on the urine dip. Some of the secondary forms of glomerular proteinuria could be because you know uh, glomerular dam damage caused by diabetes mellitus, by systemic lupus erythematosus or henoid scoliosis purpura. Uh, primary um, tubulopathies could be cystinosis, Wilson disease, Lewis disease, polycystic kidney disease, mitochondrial disorders in which like the kidneys, uh, tubules are affected structurally and that can, would lead to proteinuria or some of the secondary causes where these tubules are damaged because of uh, certain factors like heavy metal poisoning, uh, especially the mercury poisoning or lead poisoning. It could happen because of acute tubular necrosis, because of dehydration or because of any infection could be tubular institutional nephritis which can be caused by different types of drugs especially NSAIDs prolonged use of NSAIDs or it could be secondary to obstructive uropathy like for example there is a stone or tumor something blocking the ureter as a backflow and that eventually damages the uh, renal tubule so like there could be a myriad of different reasons which can give rise to what we call a pathological or persistent proteinuria either of glomerular or either of uh, tubular origin. Um, then how do we measure urinary proteins? So the urinary proteins are number one, the most common uh, you know, method of detecting that is what we call as a urine dip, which basically, you know, the protein detection of the urine dip basically measures albumin concentration and it does via colorimetric reaction. So there is a reaction which leads to color changes on that strip uh, between albumin and the chemical is known as tetrabromophenol. So if there is a um, usually um, uh, it shows different forms of green shade so again uh, you might have seen the strip you can like for example match it with the different uh, you know uh, sort of shades shown on the bottle but usually if it doesn't change the color we say it is negative if it is showing some form of color change like if you match it with the bottles traces mean that uh, probably the 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 protein quantity is like either 15 to 30 milligram per deciliter. If it is 1 plus, it probably means between 30 and 100, 2 plus between 100 and 300, 3 plus between 300 to 1000 like that would be, and I told you earlier that 1000 is probably the nephrotic. So 4 plus would be more than like, you know, 1000 uh, milligram per deciliter where which we call the nephrotic range proteinuria. But as I told you that urine dip does not detect low molecular weight proteins like you know alpha globulin or some form of uh, para proteins like uh, that uh, you know are uh, that can be filtered in multiple myeloma which happens which can happen in adults so urine dipstick is one of the commonest uh, method of detecting proteins in the urine uh, remember uh, with dipstick method there are certain limitations and that you can get false positive false positive means there's no proteinuria but it looks like there is proteinuria and that could be because of alkaline or a concentrated urine that could be because of uh, blood in the urine like for example hematuria or if somebody's got uti leading to pyuria bacteria or let's say uh, you know you have placed a strip uh, in the urine sample for a prolonged period of time or there is a presence of certain quaternary ammonium compounds in the urine so they can give you all like a false positive results and at the same time you can have false negative results as well, like it which means proteinuria is there but the urine dip is not showing so that usually happens with a very acidic urine or very dilute urine or um, if there are some other proteins other than the albumin in the urine so the sensitivity um, and specificity of this uh, urine depth protein nuria, you know, detecting tests, like especially if the, uh, you know, the, the range of protein nuria is high, like for example, three plus, they are 96 and 87 uh, percent sensitivity and specificity respectively. So the sensitivity and specificity actually increases when the range of protein nuria, uh, or if there is heavy protein nuria. The less the protein nuria, the sensitivity and specificity may be a bit lower. Uh, there are some other tests like the sulfosalic acid test. I'm not going to go in the detail of that. This is usually done in the laboratories in which you like put some three drops of uh, sulfosalicylic acid, uh, you know, 20% to 5 ml of urine and then you look if there is any precipitation or not. So precipitation, the more the precipitation, it means more turbidity and more presence of uh, protein. So they used to do it, but <clears throat> these days uh, it's a cumbersome time. It's not done that much. Then it's the quantitative assessment. So quantitative assessment means 
like we actually quantify how much protein is there in the urine and the best uh, measure of that is a spot protein to creatinine ratio so spot means you take a urine sample and you look at the ratio of the protein to creatinine now protein and creatinine like here we by protein protein we means probably albumin or other like you know high molecular weight proteins and creatinine is also a protein but creatinine is a special protein and creatinine basically is filtered around the clock so creatinine is a waste product and it is constantly filtered by the kidney so the in other words like 20 over a 24 uh, hour uh, time period the excretion of creatinine is constant so we take the ratio of the protein if any to creatinine in the urine to see how much are the proteins so normal value of like protein to creatinine ratio in a child who is less than two years is usually 0.5 milligram so 0.5 milligram of protein to one milligram of creatinine in other words like you know the it would be a half of so every one milligram of creatinine it would be less than 0.5 milligram of albumin or if you take it in millimoles that would be less than 50 microgram protein per millimole of creatinine in children who are more than two years it's even less so that would be less than 0.2 milligram protein per milligram of creatinine or less than 20 milligram protein per millimole of creatinine so the thing is that that uh, in other words that uh, you know the levels of protein as compared to creatinine being filtered is always very low is always low because let's say if one milligram is being filtered the filtration of uh, let's say albumin would be even less than like 0.2 okay or 20 percent of that so this is the spot protein to creatinine ratio is usually rule because if it is raised it simply means like there is more protein coming into the urine and that means either there is some form of uh, tubulopathy or glomerulopathy some of the disadvantages with spot protein to creatinine ratio is that usually sometimes it can overestimate uh, the actual protein which is being excreted if the urine is very dilute or it can underestimate if the urine is very concentrated so let's say a child who is not let's say who's not been drinking well and uh, he's producing very concentrated urine so in that concentrated urine if you let's say you do a urine spot um, protein to creatinine ratio and it comes out uh, you feel like it is probably normal it may be that it is underestimating that and similarly a ch child who is passing very dilute urine and you think oh it's positive probably that might be a bit of overestimation so it's, it's always keep these things in mind in practice i think most probably you'll come across more concentrated urine because you know children coming with fever or some form of dehydration so concentrated urine and if you're doing a spot um, protein to creatinine ratio remember it can underestimate that some people go for like a 24 hour urine protein test it's a bit cumbersome because you need to have a 24 hour urine sample not an easy thing but that would be the best you know sort of uh, method to give you the actual estimate of urinary protein to creatinine ratio but anyhow if you have got a spot uh, let's say protein to creatinine ratio and you multiply it by 0.63 so that would give you the total amount of protein in grams per meter square filtered per day so that is another way in which you know the things can be extrapolated or sort of an, an, an approximate estimate can be uh, guessed by taking your urinary protein to creatinine ratio based on a spot test and you multiply it by 0.63 okay so remember this this maths as well so if you've got a spot and you multiply it by 0.63 what you will get you will get the total amount of protein coming in the urine which would be in the grams per meter square per day and i've told you already you know the nephrotic range would be 1000 milligram that is one gram per meter square per day okay so keep those things in mind uh evaluation of uh let, let's say if somebody has got persistent proteinuria so what you need to do number one history and physical examination so you ask like if the child had any fever if he's suffering from any sort of you know uh, joint pains or uh, had any repeated urine infections things like that things which are like very much specific to urine is that if there has been change in urine volume or color like for example if there has been any uh, blood coming in the urine or if there has been like change recent change in the color 
look for any evidence of edema so if there is like pedal edema or sacral edema also also examine the blood pressure because usually uh, in children who have got some form of glomerulopathies the blood pressure might be raised also talk, uh, ask about recent streptococcal infections throat or um, skin infections or ask about uh, family history for renal disease or any hearing loss hearing loss and kidney disease think of alport syndrome also pay attention to the time of sampling so if somebody is coming to your clinic and he's got a febrile illness or he came after intensive physical exercise or had a seizure and uh, you know you get protein remember that would be probably a transient proteinuria so remember the context is very very important okay if you feel like there is you are not sure the best thing would be to repeat the test in asymptomatic cases okay so you can do an early morning uh, urine dip okay which uh, would never show protein if it is showing protein then probably you can do another one after some time so if more than two samples would be basically persistent proteinuria but somebody who hasn't got uh, protein in the early morning sample but later on in the during day he has got uh, let's say protein but that's most probably orthostatic proteinuria and measure the protein to creatinine ratio on the first morning urine sample okay so that would also give you an idea so of quantifying the amount of protein coming in the urine so you can get the spot protein to creatinine ratio and if you multiply it by 0.63 you can get the amount of protein in grams per meter square per day okay uh, so how do we interpret like some basic uh, sort of uh, pearls is that remember if you have got a normal protein to creatinine ratio and a normal urine analysis you don't need to do anything i mean the best you can do is to repeat the urine dip in a year if uh, the uh, there is a normal protein to creatinine ratio on the first morning urine sample but there is proteinuria on the second upright specimen i told you nothing in the morning but later on in the day urine dip is positive for, that is orthostatic proteinuria but if there is elevated protein to creatinine ratio okay more than 0.2 okay in children more than like you know two years of age and there is a positive dip stack on the second specimen so elevated protein to creatinine that is the first morning the first morning sample is very 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 important if you are trying to work a proteinuria so the first one is positive remember that is something that you have to look into then you always repeat a second one okay somewhere during the day so if the first one is showing elevated protein to creatinine ratio and the second one also comes up positive for uh, let's say protein one plus or two plus that is persistent protein and that is where you would go further to look into the causes what is causing if there is a glomerular uh, organic reason or if there's a tubulopathy or whatever some of the other lab tests that can be done with these things are other form of renal function tests that i would discuss in my coming lectures cm electrolytes and maybe you can look into the cholesterol albumin and total protein levels to see if they are down or not if you are suspecting glomerulonephritis you have to look at the complements level c3 and c4 which might be down you might be doing the streptozyme enzymes like for example anti dns b and you can look for anti-nuclear antibodies as a screening test for certain forms of autoimmune disorders like sles those people who have got uh, liver disease like for example chronic liver disease because of hepatitis b and c you probably uh, have to look into hepatitis b and c serology because uh, b and c hepatitis are associated with some form of uh, immune related damage to the kidneys as well and uh, in certain areas where you think that uh, there might be an exposure to hiv virus it's important to do hiv testing as well Imaging studies we usually do in children like those who are getting worked up for persistent protein, yeah, renal ultrasound and uh, avoiding cystoyurthrography, uh, especially in male, uh, you know, children can be done depending on what you are thinking of. If you think there is an obstructive uropathy leading backward flow and that is damaging the kidneys, like for example, posterior walls causing repeated UTIs and then, you know, uh, leading to proteinuria. You can do VCUG or you can do renal ultrasound. For symptomatic children, remember, uh, you have to look into the non-specific things like fever, malice, weight loss, which might show a malignancy or non-urinary specific things like rash, purpura, arthritis, which means an immune-based probably mechanism going on, urinary specific like hypertension, you know, edema, things like that, which might uh, tell you that there is some form of glomerulonephritis. Uh, always evaluate uh, see if the child is fulfilling the criteria for nephrotic syndrome okay that albuminuria uh, proteinuria okay um, uh, low um, blood albumins and uh, high cholesterol and things like that which would like fulfill the criteria for nephrotic syndrome and uh, one of the most commonest reasons are minimal chain disease 
also consider biopsy so if remember in children we don't directly go for biopsy so let's say if you have found the reason for uh, proteinuria let's say uh, minimal chain disease or something you put them on steroids and uh, let's say after some time there is a relapse or they are not getting better and it's still persistent proteinuria it can happen even after hsp or something then in that particular case you might have to go for uh you what you call as a kidney biopsy okay so the, the structure of the glomeruli have to be seen under the microscope to see what sort of pathology is going on because that can be treated with specific types of drugs to address this issue or uh, you can do like sort of a you know a, a urine microscopy to see if there are rbc's cost and white blood cell cost and to see if uh, the immature of glomerular or tubular origin and also looking at the plasma creatinine levels because that generally tells you how good or bad the renal function is uh, this is the algorithm uh, for evaluation of symptom asymptomatic proteinuria in children. So if there is abnormal dipstick, I told you that, you know, you have to do a first morning specimen. If that is normal, nothing to, to do. But if it is positive, you have to do another sample. If that is also showing, then you do further evaluation and further testing, which could be form of, you know, doing serum electrolytes, cholesterol, albumin, C3, C4, ANA, BC serology, HIV serology. If it is form of like when traces or something again it's the same thing you would repeat the dipstick in like you know after some time maybe after six months and year and that should be on the first urine specimen in the morning and again it's the same thing if it shows something you would do another one if it is fine and the second one shows then it's probably uh what we call as orthostatic proteinuria which doesn't need any further investigation so my friends, this was all about like uh, proteinuria. Uh, what is proteinuria? How do we classify it? And how do we work up proteinuria? This was part one of this lecture. In the coming lecture, I will be talking about the other things that are part of the uh, basic renal functions. So if you've got any questions, comments or queries, put it down in the comment section below and I will be more than happy to answer your queries. Have a very good day. Take care and bye-bye.